Okay, I think we are on line now. So we're starting the fourth and final day of this Math and Arts Festival. Uh, the last three days have seen uh, relationships with mathemat from mathematics to games, uh, music, and dance. A different topic each day. And today is more like the hardcore math day with talks about research that four particular mathematicians do. And they'll also talk about how they find uh, artistic creativity in their work. Uh, those four speakers are Matthias Weber from Indiana University, Joseph Cho from Kobe University in Japan, uh, Gudrun Shivicek from the Technical University in Vienna, and Tim Hoffman from the Technical University in Munich. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, let them explain their own work. And we start with Matthias. So Matthias, uh, your title is Wrapped Packages, The Power of Hidden Symmetries. So please go ahead and give your talk. Okay, I'll start uh, a few minutes early then. Um, so, um, the let me see whether I can make this prettier. This is, uh, okay, I got my first piece of trouble here that I cannot move in my little pre, here we go, uh, this is better. Yes, here's my surface. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, one particular triply periodic minimal surface in free space that you can maybe vaguely see. Is this visible for my co-participants? Just to check that I'm not completely yeah. in the dark. You're going to all see this? Okay, great. So this is the so-called IWP surface. And I will show other better images than this one later. Um, the uh, name, which is a bit cryptic, IWP, was uh, coined by Alan Schoen, and it refers to these yellow and red sticks that you see there on the surface. These are the so-called skeletal graphs. And the I is an abbreviation for the face-centric Bravais lettuce. This is something that the crystallographers are interested in. So it's actually the, du the, the, the skeletal graph is the red thing you see there. And this is the dual graph of that particular lettuce. Uh, the WP is even more cryptic. The WP stands for wrapped package. And this comes from, the, this is for the yellow sticks. And when you put four sticks loosely together and bundle them sort of up in the middle, and then they fall apart, they form this little pattern you see there. And Alan thought this would be a good name. So he just um, temporarily called the surface uh, IWP and uh, the name stuck. So this is it. And I'm going to talk about uh, symmetries of the surface that are not as visible as they should be. And um, this is something we mathematicians have maybe in common with artists that we are in many ways obsessed with various kinds of symmetry. And some of the oldest symmetric objects are the so-called platonic solids. They're particularly symmetric. They all look the same from every side. So the cube as we know, for instance, right here, has six squares as faces. All the faces meet at corners so that there are three squares around each corner. And you can rotate any vertex into any other vertex and any edge into any other edge. So it's kind of really very, very symmetric. And the same is true for the other four platonic solids of which we will encounter uh, soon the cube and the octahedron again. So this was maybe the earliest instance of three-dimensional symmetries that people studied. Um, here's an example that uh, go, is historically a little bit um, closer to our times than Plato. This is a famous surface by Hermann Amandus Schwartz. So minimal surface people have since, um, since uh, uh, Lagrange asked the question whether for any boundary contour you can find a minimal surface that has that boundary as a, as a contour, studied this problem, whether you can solve for a given boundary this. And clearly, everybody of us can do that. We just take our favorite coat hanger and bend it together, and then have a big tank with um, some foamy stuff in it, some soap liquid. And we pull, put it in and pull it out. And then we get this nice soap film that we do in our childhood experiments and in our, uh, uh, with our kids or with other kids. So we see this should be possible that mathematicians had a hard time doing this. And Riemann was one of the first people. Riemann was one of the first people who found a, 
rather general way of attacking this problem and Hamann Amandel Schwartz independently realized how to do this in a few particular cases. And here is one case. So you see, for instance, on this particular surface, these little quadrilaterals there, and they actually are part of the edges of an octahedron. So when you build, then you take an octahedron and take a wireframe like this, dip this into soap and pull it out, you get some shape like this. And one feature that these minimal surfaces has, you can use these boundary straight lines here, these edges, to extend the surface. So you can take it and rotate this piece about it, and then you get another chunk and you can keep extending the surface. So what Schwartz did, and this is the hardcore math of my talk, is he found a formula for this thing. And here is the algebraic or the, the analytic equation, I should maybe say, for this particular surface. There are some weird functions in there. The weirdest is the F, this is an elliptic function. So it's not really something you learn in high school how to do this, but uh, it's something that still mathematicians can do. So and then can make images of the surface or do other things and analyze properties. So this is a simple surface and it's uh, nice and it has many symmetries. As you can see, this fits like nicely in a cube but you can stack copies of it. As you can see, this is the periodic extension. So it becomes like a, a big plumbing system. So uh, when you think about this as each, each piece from the previous slide as a plumbing piece, uh, that means you have six sides you can get in and you can get uh, out five other sides. And uh, then you put these together and you get, um, I don't know how useful this would be in reality, but uh, for plumbing, but then at least it's possible. And you see there's an inside and an outside. And one particular feature of the surface is that actually the inside is the same as the outside. So when you would live on the surface, like on the, in the yellow part here, and you would walk around or crawl around as a bug, say, you would feel exactly the same as if you were another bug living on the inside of the blue region but you would never be able to meet each other. So this would be kind of sad, but uh, this is how this is because it extends infinitely. And uh, this is how this surface works and functions. So um, the one thing that I will do is I want to approximate these surfaces by polyhedral surfaces. And you can see in approximation, it kind of looks similar. You see, we have stacked these things that are plumbing pieces together. You can compare these and they look kind of really Pretty much the same, except that this here now we see squares as faces. So we can build this by taking a cube and uh, removing all the faces from the cube so that you just have the skeleton. And then you attach cubes to all the six faces sticking out in all six directions. And then you put these all together. And uh, then you get something that's kind of very symmetric again, like these platonic solids. So you see you have actually this time six squares that fit around a single vertex. You can go around one, two, three, four, five, six, and you keep going. And this works at every single vertex. So like for the platonic solids, the surface as a periodic surface has the feature that it's so symmetric that you can send any square to any other square, any vertex to any vertex, any edge to any other edge. And this is called platonic. So this would be a platonic solid if it was a solid, but it's periodic. So it's an infinite platonic solid, if you like. It was uh, described and part of a classification that Coxeter did. It's called the mu cube or in a symbolic notation 464. And uh, this is a polygonal approximation in a very good sense, which I'll explain in a minute of the Schwartz P surface. So uh, we can even create some other version of it. So we cannot do this in the Euclidean plane. We are not able to take six squares and arrange them around a single corner because, uh, well, the angles add up to too much, to 270 degrees, to uh, what is it, uh, uh, 360, 400, uh, this is 180 plus, yeah, this is 540 degrees. This is too much for the Euclidean plane. But in the hyperbolic plane, you have also squares. So that's what you see here is the disk model of the so-called hyperbolic plane. And all these little polygonal regions here that are shaded are in fact just squares, except that they don't have 90 degree angles, but they have 60 degree angles at each vertex. And this means we can fit six of them around each vertex. And uh, in fact, even though it doesn't look like these are squares, for somebody who has hyperbolic eyes, these are perfect squares. So this edge is the same length as that edge, the same as that, the same as that. All these tiny little edges have all the same hyperbolic length and all the angles are 60 degrees everywhere. So this is 
in the hyperbolic plane a map of a region that's tiled by squares, but special squares, squares with 60 degree angles. And uh, what you see here is a map of the surface that I showed you here. So let's think about this briefly. Let's think again. We pretend we are a bug living on this yellow region here, and we start crawling. So we're going to travel, we're going to explore. And what we do is we cross an edge, enter a new square, continue to the other side, opposite to it, and find another square and keep going. And then because this is part of a cube here, we go once around after four squares. And this works in every single direction. No matter what square we are in, we can start walking, cross an edge, go to the opposite edge, go around, go around. And that means after four squares, you come back. The same works for this map if we follow a simple rule. The rule is that this red boundary you see here is kind of marking the end of the map. This means if you hit a boundary here, you have actually to step out, move to the opposite side and step back in again. This is what people often describe as, you've played probably, I mean, I have played, I don't know, in my childhood, asteroids on a computer screen, where uh, you have these little meteors and a spaceship that exits accidentally at the bottom of the screen, but re-enters at the top. So you can never leave actually the game. And when you go to the left, you enter to the right. And this is just a touch more complicated because you have more edges here. So if you, for instance, look at this blue line here, this blue line will hit this red boundary edge here. And it will have to re-enter at the bottom, at the opposite side, which is this edge here. So you see this blue line actually continues here. Then it hits this edge, which is this red edge has an opposite, which is this one. So it will re-enter there, hit this one. This is this edge, connects to the right, and then it will keep going and this becomes a closed curve. And then you see what this closed curve does is it starts in a square, hyperbolic square, it hits an edge, enters the next square, goes to the opposite edge, enters a new square, continues. Now we use this so-called identification. So we go to the opposite side, which is here. We, are, we have followed this path, which is that segment here. So we continue to the opposite edge of that square, hit another edge, hit another edge, hit another edge, and after four steps, we are back where we are. So this is exactly the same behavior as we saw on the mu cube. And this works for any of these squares because the whole construction is very symmetric. When we go, for instance, take the same square but take this curve, well, this will just be the mirror image of the curve system with the blue curves we had here. If you do this in any other square, the same works because this is also rotationally symmetric. So this is a model, if you like, a planar model or a map of the mu cube in a nice way. So if you would live on a mu cube, you could, for instance, just say, okay, instead of using this three-dimensional picture, we draw a map and then navigation and the mu cube comes easy. So this is sort of what Mercator would have done to the mu cube if our world would have been a mu cube instead of a nice round earth. So this is the first part of the story. The uh, story now continues uh, with, with more symmetries. The point of my talk is that the symmetries we have seen so far are Euclidean symmetries. So we take an object, we shift it somewhere else. This is a translation, you can rotate it. These are Euclidean congruences or symmetries and we typically consider objects as equal. If there is a symmetry that takes one to the other, or, there's a, or a shape is symmetric, whether there's a symmetry that transforms the shape in itself. So this is our notion of symmetry. And the symmetries we usually think of as human beings are these Euclidean symmetries because we are just so used to living in Euclidean space. But there are more symmetries. And the, one of the most flexible symmetries mathematicians study are so-called conformal symmetries. What you see here are kind of curved shapes in the plane. All the boundaries are circles, which is irrelevant, but I just had these images lying around. And you see there are four vertices where these guys meet at certain angles. And uh, these are squares. These are all conformally squares. And what you can do is you can therefore find what is called a conformal or angle preserving map that takes any of these shapes and send it to any of the other shapes. So these are congruent shapes in the sense of conformal geometry. And conformal geometry is useful because it allows you to do enough analysis to write down formulas like the one I showed you for the Schwartz surface. And uh, so you can do analysis with them and you can uh, parametrize minimal surfaces, for instance. So we will study certain conformal symmetries of surfaces that are more flexible than the Euclidean symmetries. 
um, history progresses. We go to 1933, an unfortunate year, and Bertolt Stessmann, who was a student of Karl Ludwig Siegel, uh, he uh, was given the task for his thesis to solve a similar problem like Schwartz did, but for the different boundary contour, which is more complicated. So you see, for instance, one of the, these are actually three copies already of this boundary contour. Here's one of them. This is again a quadrilateral in space. There's a right angle here, there's a right angle there, and these are 45 and I think 45 degrees. Uh, this is hard to understand the shape. When you rotate it about this edge, you get a, a, the exact copy will look like this. This is kind of misleading because it looks almost like this is be, this point is behind that point, but it's actually in front. So this is a very twisted quadrilateral in space. And then you rotate this again around that edge, you get a third copy, which is this one. So you get a bigger hexagon in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six vertices, that is decomposed into these four quadrilaterals. So Stessmann solved, did exactly what Schwartz did as for, for this particular surface. And you can uh, then do the same as you can do to Schwartz surface, then you can extend this and make it a periodic surface. And so here is a larger piece of the same thing. Uh, this is interesting. I don't th think many people have seen this. In particular, I don't think Stessmann knew how this would really look like. It's kind of hard to see in this picture, but I think this would be nice, make a nice architectural model for some kind of pavilion that has uh, an interior top level and there is a bottom level below. So this is a nice structure, but it has a deficit that uh, people would dislike, namely it is going to have self intersections. You see, for instance, here, these lines that are on the surface intersect, there are three of them and these are essentially the cornered axis. So they meet each other orthogonally at right angles at this corner here. And this means there is no way that this surface can be without self intersections. And that was the end of the story and uh, for a while until Alan Schoen came along in 1970. This is a picture is a little bit older, but he's still around and kicking. So he worked for NASA for a while and uh, set himself the task to start with the skeletons I showed you in the beginning and find minimal surfaces that have these as graphs and their complementary regions. So you try to take two of these skeletal graphs and put something in between that's a minimal surface, find equations for it, create models, and you can uh, do this. And he did this. So uh, here is, for instance, uh, what he did. Here is one of his models for the IWP surface that I uh, showed you in the beginning. So there's an original model of his that he made in, at NASA. Uh, you can see it's decomposed into these little quadrilaterals. These are actually pieces that are conjugate to the Stessmann quadrilateral that he considered. So it turns out while Stessmann surface is not particularly interesting, the conjugate surface, which is the conjugate surface is a construction you can do to any minimal surface, which will create a new minimal surface out of it, which shares a lot of symmetries with it. So the conjugate of the Stessmann piece is not bounded by these straight lines, but it has reflectional planar curves here across which you can reflect. So what you get there are lots of little quadrilaterals, and you can glue them together. And then you get a model like this. And to make these, um, I can actually make a little break. I guess I still have uh, a little bit of time left. Um, but not much. So uh, this, yeah, I will show this at the end. So I have this, this mold right here. So he created a mold that's of some hard plastic, I think, and here's the form for it. And then he would use a vacuum former to create tons of these little quadrilaterals, do them together and get a model like this. And you can imagine this took forever, but uh, this is what he did. And uh, here is the piece you saw above in the original physical model, constructed mathematically together with the two dual graphs, the two scalar graphs. So the I graph, the uh, graph for the Ravier lattice is here and the red package graph, the yellow graph is out there. And uh, this, you see from that this piece has the same cubical symmetries like the P surface. So it's an interesting question what you can do with that. So um, there's also a polygonal approximation of it, which is also known. This is uh, called octahedral 312. So you obtain this polyhedron by starting with an octahedron instead of a cube. You remove all the faces from the octahedron and you attach octahedra annuli to everything you had before. So these annuli are kind of like 
prism, anti prisms you have there. So you leave out the top and bottom face and you just stick it on. And then you can keep going. You get an empty middle piece next again and the star of these, uh, these octahedra and becomes a periodic polyhedral surface in space. Now, this polyhedral surface, however, is not platonic. However, when you use Euclidean symmetries, you can see this. There are two different kinds of edges, essentially. There are edges that go across, like this one here, or that one, one of these octahedra. And then there are the ones where, along which you attach. And you cannot get an attaching edge to an edge that goes across. So this is not platonic because there are not enough Euclidean symmetries. However, you can make a map of the surface. And this is the same kind of map that I've shown you for the Schwartz surface, except that it's a bit bigger. So there's, there are more pieces to it. And the amazing thing is that in the hyperbolic plane with the hyperbolic symmetries, which are also conformal symmetries, you actually have enough symmetries to map every edge to every other edge and the surface becomes platonic. So what you see here in this domain, the, ver the vertex at the center here and the blue triangles are exactly the blue triangles you see here for the light blue triangles there. So this, these six blue triangles that wrap around an octahedron are repeated in this image. There are one, two, three, four, five, six of them. And the curve you see here, light blue, goes once around one of these octahedral um, ribbons that uh, are attached to the central octahedron. And this can be used to find out how you actually have to navigate this map. This time the navigation is more complicated. For instance, this edge which is labeled A has to be glued together with that edge labeled A. So when you exit there, you have to re-enter there, then you hit the B, which means you have to re-enter that B, and then you close up. So you can again travel around and you can check that this thing is indeed platonic. In particular, you have a rotation about the center of this thing by 30 degrees, because these triangles that you have here are not Euclidean triangles, there are hyperbolic triangles which have 30 degree angles at the vertices. So you can rotate by 30 degrees the entire thing. This is 360 divided by 12. So there's an order 12 rotation. And this is related to the rotation you would see here, which goes about the center of a top face. So if you take a cube, you can rotate the cube by 90 degrees, but, this, and that, but you cannot rotate it by just 30 degrees. But the surface as an abstract, surface with conformal automorphisms is more symmetric. There's a 30 degree rotation about the vertical axis that takes the surface to itself, even though we cannot see it with our uh, restricted Euclidean eyes. So uh, then came a discovery for, by Dami Lee, who is, uh, was one of my, my PhD students. In her thesis, she proved that the IWP surface and this octahedral approximation are actually conformally the same surface. So this means that the IWP surface also has this automorphism, which allows you to rotate it by 90 degrees, uh, 30 degrees about this vertical axis. And this is surprising, and this is maybe useful, and this indeed has a geometric consequence. One can look at what is called the associate family, uh, which you see part of in this top strip here, but this is just a mere toy image of what you'll see in a minute. Uh, there was a paper in 1950, 1990 by Leiden, Heide, and Ninham that asserted that in this associate family of this IWP surface, there in fact exist interesting embedded surfaces. Namely, whenever you hit the 120 degree angle of rotation in the associate family, you hit another embedded surface. This is similar to what happens to the P surface where you find the gyroid. But for the IWP surface, it's kind of uninteresting or not so interesting because this new embedded surface turns out to be actually congruent to the IWP surface. And this becomes immediately clear when you understand that the IWP surface has this hidden symmetry. This is responsible for the six, this, this ability to turn by 30 degrees is responsible for these additional embedded associate IWP surface. But it's still a curious phenomenon that when you go through the associate family of the IWP surface that you hit these surfaces here. This is almost the end of my talk. I can show you a better little video of the, um, of the, the uh, animation that goes to the associate family. What you see here is uh, my humble artistic view of the inside of the IWP surface. If you make it with textured material that is highly reflective and a little translucent, you would see something uh, um, psychedelic like this. 
and I can talk more about this, but my time is almost up and I think I will rather show you this little animation here. So uh, what you see here is the associate family of the IWP service. And you see a couple of instances like now and uh, like now and now. And here's something where I stop, which is actually a copy of the Stesman surface. So we have hit the 90 degree angle where we hit the so-called conjugate surface. This is, the, this is a version of the Stesman surface. You might not recognize it, but it's a different assembly of pieces of it. And then you continue through the associate family and that uh, you hit again a point like this one a bit before where you see vertices match. This is another version of the IWP surface in the associate family that Lee and his co-authors discovered numerically and uh, that we now understand that it has to exist. And then you keep going, go, oops, whenever the vertices touch like here, then you hit either the Stesman surface or you hit uh, the IWP. Here's IWP again and uh, it continues and goes back to the original surface. Then you remember this at the moment we have the whitish, the off-white color outside, but when we are all the way through, then it has turned inside out and we will have in a second, the or in 18 seconds, the uh, orange color outside. And this is how this assembles. So let's wait three seconds. And uh, this is then uh, the end of my talk. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'll, happy, I'll be happy to take them. Okay, thank you for a very nice talk. And we do have some questions. We have quite a few coming in on Twitch, I believe. Okay. Let me run through as many as I can. We, we only have a few minutes for questions, but um, the first question was, do straight lines lie on the Schwartz P surface or on the platonic version? Uh, both. Uh, let me go to both. Uh, we have, uh, whoop. here you see straight lines. This is on the Schwartz P surface. These are the straight lines on the Schwartz P surface and they continue on forever. And we have the same straight lines, in fact, on the platonic approximation. They are, so they're both, so you can do the following. You can build this model by taking a rhombus. It has to have the right edge lengths, but you take take a certain rhombus and then you bend it along its diagonal by half. And then you keep rotating. Like you take the same wireframe as you take for this octahedral wireframe that you take for the P surface, which you would put into soap, but you just make it out of paper because you don't have sturdy soap or I don't have sturdy soap. So then you can do the same game as you do for the Schwartz P surface. You rotate this piece about its edge, glue a second copy across in the same position, in the right position. And then you keep going and extend it like this. And this will create the surface with the same straight lines, but uh, squares as faces instead of curved things. Okay, and another question was, uh, do these such spaces like the hyperbolic disk exist in nature? <laughs> ah, um, do they exist in nature? Well, um, uh, you see, this depends on what you call nature. There is, there is what is called general relativity, which is an approximation of the universe. So the universe is curved as a space time and there, and gravity is responsible for the curvature. And there are regions of space that are positively and negatively curved. So there are parts of space at a certain scale might look like a little bit like the hyperbolic plane, but at a very, very large scale. And I think it would be very hard to observe that and particularly not accurately because it would just be a physical thing. It's like, it's like saying the earth is a plane. This is not quite accurate. We know the earth is curved, but it's also not accurate to say that the earth is a sphere because it's not perfectly round. And similarly, parts of the universe would be close to hyperbolic map. And there are other cases where in, um, we have used hyperbolic geometry to model certain behavior, like when you study dynamic systems, for instance, when you want to predict the future in chaotic systems, you come in among phenomena that are typical for uh, the hyperbolic geometry and the hyperbolic plane. And uh, in, in some sense, the hyperbolic geometry is a useful model for certain real phenomena, but uh, nobody has really been able to visit hyperbolic space, I'm afraid. <laughs> Okay, and uh, just two more very brief quest uh, questions, very briefly. Um, are these polygonal approximation algorithms unique? And do people study how quickly they converge? 
uh, no and yes. So they're not unique. The other approximations, uh, they are for the p-surface, for instance, there, are, there, is, there is another one that uses hexagons instead of squares, but the squares are a bit easier to visualize. And uh, the people study how they converge. So for instance, when you numerically want to find minimal surfaces, there are various methods. One uses what I call plateau solvers. So one has, this is, this is an interesting and important application. And you want to study certain um, partial differential equations and solutions for that that are relevant in, in nature than the algorithms that are used to find minimal surfaces are minimization algorithms and you start with the polygonal approximations and then you refine things and make them smooth and people are very much interested in making these as quick as possible. Yeah, this is, this is very important uh, research in numerical mathematics. Okay, and one last question. Which software is used for creating the images? Um, Various. I use for, for prototyping and some computations, I use Mathematica. Um, then I use a freeware ray tracing pro program called POV Ray to ray trace the images of the polyhedra, for instance, this one or uh, these here. These are all ray traced. And this is freeware. But, and uh, you, I have a web page where you can download the models in POV Ray and you can render them yourselves. Uh, this is uh, uh, minimalsurfaces.blog. And uh, this, this, you can use that and go there and to check everything out if you like. So that has, has tons of things. So this is mostly what I use. I use occasionally other things like the Surface Evolver is something I've occasionally used, which is, has been written by Ken Brecky and which is a very robust piece of software to solve tattoo problems, for instance. And, uh, but this is, this is about it. Okay, Mithi, thank you very much. And before we go into the next talk, we're going to have, briefly have an show a video. It's an Infinity Elements video by Lee Allison, and it shows a minimal surface called the catenoid. Uh, it's an immersive experiential program of minimal surface imagery with backing given by live sonic, uh, live sonic responses to, to each surface that's shown. And the aim is to show the infinite nature of surfaces in space. So let's have a look at the catenoid.
Okay. Now we will go into our next talk by Joseph Cho, who is in Western Japan at Kobe University, and he will speak on shape generation via discrete p holomorphic functions. Okay. Uh, thank, th thank you for the nice introduction. Um, so today I'm, I'm very happy to give a talk on what I am studying and hopefully explore or explain how what I study, which is pure mathematics, can be related to some things that we see in real life. So uh, here we go. So this talk is based on the collaboration with Wayne Rossman, um, Sung Duk Yang, and Masashi Asmoto. And today I'm going to talk about generating shapes using something called discrete p holomorphic functions. So first, let's talk about um, meshes, planar meshes, and we're going to talk about shapes. So there, everything we are surrounded by shapes in the real world, and a lot of times we we view certain shapes as having some artistic value. Um, there was a little conference with a two country project between Austria and Japan in which a lot of mathematicians gathered, the geometers gathered, and then we played with some plasters. And after making these plasters, we put them into <clears throat> a balloon and then we molded these plasters into shapes that may or may not have a meaning, but you wait until this plaster hardens and then you just create some shapes. Um, so, of course, an artist can also conceive shapes as some part of some part of a starting point of the um, art. But the question also comes whether the artwork is feasible. Now, imagine with a plaster, it's really easy to realize this shape into the real world. But for instance, imagine you are designing a building that's shaped maybe like an umbrella then you'll have to think whether this can really be built or not. So in some sense, this feasibility question is of course an engineering question, but I would like to point out that it's not just an engineering question. Um, there's this sculpture or spatial art that I really like by Bruce Nauman, who was a artist in the um, artist from America. And he had this installation called corridor installation. So what this does is it finds two wooden walls and makes a very, very narrow corridor through which a person can barely fit through and walk facing forward so that the wooden walls would be right up against your face. Now, the really cool thing about this installation was that when I was walking through it, I started interacting with the walls in the sense that these walls completely blocked all of my auditory perceptions and hence all the ambient sounds. And I realized that hearing these white noises and ambient sounds was what gave me a spatial perception. So by blocking these auditory information, Bruce Nauman actually forced me to feel enclosed, forced me to feel very anxious about lack of space. And I think, when you view art as something, as an object that interacts with people, and if that interaction is also part of the experience of art, the fact that you have to be able to somehow manifest these ideas, these shapes into real life, is not just an engineering problem, it's also an artistic problem. But coming back to the question of feasibility, today I would like to really focus on architecture. So this is an example of a freeform architecture in Korea, which is called a Dongdaemun Plaza, Dongdaemun Design Plaza. It's a very free shaped architecture. It's not just a bark box shaped building. And as you can see up close <coughs> that each of these panels, this building is created by making individual panels, steel panels, and each of these panels are curved so that when they're all put together, it makes a bigger smooth shape. Now, the engineering problem comes when you look at the bigger picture in that this building is curving in different directions in different ways. So 
one would actually have to make these steel plates individually and then hope that your um, process of making these steel plates are accurate enough so that when you put them together, you actually get this smooth looking shape <clears throat> when looked at from far away. So these are some types of feasibility questions that you can think after conceiving some shape. And one of the answers that can be given <clears throat> is this another building in Korea called, it's, a, it's actually the city hall of the city of Seoul. And as you can see, this is also a free form shape with glass planes glass panes, but if you look closely, each of these triangles are reflecting a different in different colors, which kind of tells you that each of these glass panes are actually planar. And this uses the fact that triangles always determine a plane. So if you can approximate a smooth shape with triangles, then you can actually make an overall smooth looking shape, but really with using flat pieces of glass. And for instance, this is this greatly reduces the question of whether you can actually make this shape or not, because imagine you just have a flat glass sheet and you just have to cut them and then piece them together to make this shape. Of course, there's a lot more engineering that goes behind this, but this is a part of the aspect that I would like to talk about today is that how can we make these smooth looking shapes by approximating with a planar mesh? Of course, it's really easy to do in some sense if you use triangles, because again, triangles always determine a plane. But then today I would like to tackle this problem using quadrilaterals or any polygons with four sides. So to do this, <coughs> I would like to talk about distances a little bit. Um, so how do we perceive Euclidean distance is how we all do it. So let me get rid of my cursor here. So let, let's say we're given two points in the Euclidean plane in a normal plane, and then you wanna ask what this distance is. Well, one of the ways you can do this is to give each point a coordinate so that one point is x1, y1, and the other point is x2, y2, and just use this formula, which is just a glorified version of the Pythagorean theorem to find what the distance between the two points are. So in this setting, <coughs> um, this color represents the distance from the origin. So if it's darker, then the distance is higher. So if you find a set of points that are equidistant from the origin or in the same distance from the origin, then you get a circle. So this is how we usually calculate distances in real life. But then somebody comes along and says, what if we change that middle signature, middle sign to a minus? <clears throat> Well, that's what's called a Laurentian distance on the Laurentian plane. So let's see how this distance behaves. So let's say we have a two point at zero, zero and one zero, and we have that formula at the top. We use the formula to find that the distance is just one. Okay, nothing so weird so far. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rotate it slightly but make it twice as long, at least in our eyes, and then find out what the length is, and if you use the formula, then I said twice as long, but the distance seemed to have increased by just a little bit. And if I do this, if I rotate this a little further so that it makes 45 degree angles with either the horizontal or the vertical lines, then when you calculate the distance, you actually get that the distance is zero. So under this definition of distance, you can have two points that are far away from each other, but are still distance zero. Um, so one can use a similar color to talk about the distances from the origin. And in this case, the bright color X represents all the points that are distance zero from the origin. And then you have these colors and distances from each point having distance from the origin. And then if you find the path or the, or the collection of points that are equidistant from the origin, then you get something called a hyperbola. So this is a starting point of what I wanna talk about today. And to signify this, I'm gonna write a plus next to a horizontal axis and a minus to a vertical axis. So this tells you that we have a weird distance happening here. And then if it's not weird, then we're just gonna have a plus and a plus. 
this is called the signature of the metric on this plane. Now, this is a good starting point for Minkowski space, which is what I wanna talk about today. And this space is, can be perceived as having a third axis to the Lorentzian plane we had before. Now, if you forget about the third direction, then you just get two axes with two plus directions. So this is just a Euclidean plane. So any two points on this plane, if you calculate the distance, it's the distance as we know. But because we add a third direction, the definition of distance is also changed. And we're gonna see this in a bit. So let's say for now that the third direction, that the vertical direction also has a plus signature so that this is just a three dimensional space as we perceive. And then one can think of a plane as a sphere with infinite radius as this video shows <clears throat> um, as a sphere of the, as the radius of the sphere gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the part of the sphere looks more and more like more and more like a plane. So you can kind of think of sphere of planes as spheres with infinite radius. Um, all right. All right. Now coming back to the case when the third direction or the vertical direction has a minus signature. Then you can also view spheres, you can also view planes here as infinite as spheres with infinite radius. The spheres look a little different. But as you see in this video, as a, as the radius gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the sphere looks more and more like a plane. So the point of this part is that the planes in Minkowski's planes look exactly like the planes as we know. Uh, this is an important thing because we wanted to talk about meshes that has planar faces as a good way of creating, approximating a shape. But then these planes, of course, we live in Euclidean space, so we have to realize these shapes into the Euclidean space. But things that have a meaning in Minkowski space and things that look like a plane in Minkowski space, you can just take the shape and put it in Euclidean space and say, well, it has a planar mesh. So it kind of gives a reason for um, looking at these approximations in Minkowski space and then using that shape and then using that idea to just make shapes in the Euclidean space. <clears throat> okay, so now let's talk about how to actually make these shapes. So we're going to quad meshes. So what does the input data look like? Input data, an example of input data looks like this. So what this is, is this is a set of, you can think of all of these points as an intersection of lines that are at 45 degree angle and that are perpendicular to each other. And so, and then you take the diagonal lattices, what we call a diagonal lattice like this. So if you look, if you follow along these lines, then you can see that we're going in the diagonal direction <coughs> from the lattice that I explained before. So we have a discrete shape like this comprised of quadrilaterals. And this is actually a characterization of something called a discrete p holomorphic function. This differs quite a bit from the usual definition of discrete holomorphic function, but one can show for the p holomorphic functions, you can actually create any p holomorphic functions this way. And this is actually an example of a discrete holomorphic function called z to the three fifths. And also you have some less interesting examples, maybe for this lattice, you can take the diagonal edges to get this pretty mundane looking thing, which is called a Z, G is equal to Z function. But then you can come up with something that's a lot more complicated. And then if you take the diagonal lattice of this, it looks a little like this. And then this function, I do not name it here, but this is also an example of a discrete p holomorphic function. So how do we use discrete p holomorphic functions to make these curvy, but not so curvy shapes is called a discrete y stress representation. Now, I, don't tell, I won't tell you any formulas behind this, but I'll just show you how certain shapes are related. 
So for instance, if you have this discrete p-holomorphic function and put it into Weierstrass representations as a formula for getting something in the space, then you get a surface that looks like this comprised of planar quadrilaterals. Now, this is a theory strictly in math, this is a theory strictly in Minkowski space, but the thing on the right side just exists in the Euclidean space as well. And since the idea of planarity do not, does not change, this just becomes a discrete shape with planar quadrilaterals. Now you can do this for the more complicated and weird discrete P holomorphic functions. But if you put this into this formula and then you recursively calculate the surface, then you get a surface that looks like this. This is actually a little easier to see that it has planar quadrilaterals, because if you follow along one white line, then you can see that each part is straight segments, and then it turns at each vertex. Now, this is so far, this is more or less an analog of what you do in discrete minimal surface theory in Euclidean space, but there's an extra caveat to this story. So coming back to this first example, you can actually think about um, the diagonal mesh. So if you compare the two, so from this quadrilaterals, think you are connecting all the diagonals and making a new surface out of it. And this new surface is also a quadrilateral, but it's also planar quadrilaterals. So each of these quadrilaterals are actually planar. So for the same shape, you obtain two different ways of approximating using planar quadrilaterals. Now, this is a little difficult to see because the mesh is so fine. So I made, so let's go back to this example. But now let's make the mesh a little coarser. There we go. So if we connect the diagonals, then it'll look a little something like this other lines that are added now. And if you only look at those quadrilaterals, then those are also planar as well. Um, so this is a way of approximating uh, existing smooth surface with planar quadrilaterals, but by looking at these surfaces as existing in the Minkowski space, you can actually obtain different ways of approximating these, these smooth surfaces into discrete surfaces with planar quadrilaterals. Um, so this, um, this background is actually part of the discrete p holomorphic function that I showed. It was z to the 3 fifths function. And this is where I'll end my talk. Thank you. OK, Joseph, thank you very much. That was a, a really fine talk. Um, I was struck as you were giving the talk by the parallels with the previous talk by uh, Matthias. For example, when you showed Seoul City Hall, it looked a lot like the polygonal, uh, the polygonal short surface in Matthias' talk. Of course, the angles are mm -hmm. much sharper in the short surface, but it seems to be the same idea. And when you were talking about um, Minkowski space, uh, Matthias was talking about hyperbolic space, and uh, they are different, but they're, they have that common property that distances are not what we think they are, as when we use Euclidean eyes. And when you talk about discrete p-holomorphic functions, it looks a lot like tilings that uh, Matthias showed in two-dimensional mm -hmm. hyperbolic space, although uh, your initial example bent outward where his bent inward. But um, yeah, I was struck by that. And we have a couple questions coming in um, here from okay. the audience. On which, um, First one being, these surfaces look more like CMC than minimal. Do they behave like CMC in Euclidean space? No, they do not. And it, in fact, these surfaces do not have a variational property. OK. Um, a second question, what is the advantage of using quadrilaterals instead of triangles? Uh, this is a good question. So. Um, <clears throat> So in the previous video of cat modes, uh, we noticed that, so the video was certainly two dimensional, but we could see the object cat node as being three dimensional. And it's because there were lines drawn on the cat node that suggested the overall three dimensional shape of 
this thing when, when drawn in a two-dimensional plane. And this, there are of course many ways to draw lines on the catenoid and a smooth thing, but one of the best ways to show how this catenoid really bends is to draw lines along the curvature directions, which are the directions in which the surface bends the most inward or outward. And a discretization of this are quad, is quadrilaterals. <clears throat> so if you use triangles, then your discretization or your approximation might just become very dirty. For instance, you can view how a surface is approximated in Mathematica because Mathematica, when you use their functions, they triangulate their surfaces. And once you actually tell it, tell the program to show the triangles and how it's triangulated, you can see how messy it is. And it really does not show any of the geometrical properties that the smooth guys enjoyed. So using quadrilaterals can actually be very beneficial both in terms of um, design and perception because quadrilaterals can really show these most bending directions very efficiently. Okay, and we've got four other questions. I'll, I'll run through them. Uh, what is the advantage of using quadrilaterals? Uh, sorry, uh, are a bounded p holomorphic functions constants? No. In fact, p holomorphic functions are not analytic. Okay, and then are there quadrilateral examples in architecture, or is this a new idea? No, there are already examples in architecture. There is a great work being done by group um, led by Helmut Putman, and um, they have great examples. They actually do a little more than just planar quadrilaterals. They actually talk. They also talk about each face is being either cylindrical, cylindrical, or spherical, and then approximating a given smooth shape into these either planar, cylindrical, cylindrical, or spherical faces. So there are definitely real life examples of this. Okay, and uh, one last question, and I think this is related to the narrow corridor that you were talking about. Um, how yeah. do you think the curvature of the shapes you describe affects a person inhabiting or experiencing them? That is a great question. I think uh, that, that's a really good question. Um, I think, of course, the, the, when, when a person perceives a shape, we perceive it without any, um, any relations to curvature. It's not like we look at a shape and say, oh, I know the curvature of that shape. But maybe one can find, I don't know, maybe one can find I'm in the mood for this curvature and make a shape out of it. Then wouldn't that shape, for instance, tell you how you feel, maybe? Uh, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so next we will have uh, the second infinity elements video. Uh, this one will be on the Costa surface, another famous minimal surface.
Okay, and it's now time for our next talk, which will be by Gudrun Shevichek in Vienna. And her title is Proof Without Words. So Gudrun, please go ahead. Oh, hi to everybody. Can you hear me and can you see my presentation? Yes, and yes. Very good. So thanks a lot to the organizer for this very special festival. It's my great pleasure to give some insights into my work, also to non-mathematicians. And I decided to talk about proofs. And as Catherine mentioned in a discussion, I guess, yesterday evening, um, there are two main tasks for mathematicians. Namely, first, they have to find good statements, good conjectures that they have to prove or that they want to prove. And then they have to prove that. And the idea of my talk is to focus on the second issue, namely to focus on proofs. And this is probably a rather crazy thing to do if you want to give a talk to mostly non-mathematicians, because even for a mathematician, if I see a new proof, if I read a new proof, it's usually or often quite hard to understand the idea behind it. So it takes a while. If you read a complicated proof, usually it's one, two, three, four pages long. So you take a while to understand what's going on. So in general, of course, it doesn't make sense to present some proofs to non-mathematicians. So what I plan to do is, my plan is I want to talk about some special proofs, namely on proofs without words. And these are proofs that are only based on visual elements without any text around. So just some sketches or um, pictures. And this is a quite old technique. So maybe you have seen some visual proofs for Pythagorean th theorem. They are quite famous, but there are many others. So there are some journals that are supporting these kind of proofs. And there are also three nice, really fun books from Nielsen's. There are three volumes and there are, it's a collection of many, many of these kind of proofs. So first, maybe a question that comes to your mind is, are these proofs rigorous and accepted as actual proofs? And I think that's a really hard question to answer. And probably the answer depends also on the mat mathematician that you are asking. So I think there is no right answer to that. Um, but maybe we can discuss about that afterwards. But I believe that they're really helpful. Um, helpful to explain proofs to non-mathematicians, as we hopefully see in this talk. But they're also helpful to get new ideas about elegant proofs, maybe, but also about results that you want to prove. So I think they're really helpful. But at the end, usually, I'm very happy if I have both. If I have a proof without words, so some pictures, some visual elements, but also an abstract rigorous proof in the usual styles so or a series of statements that are logically connected. The outline of my talk is the following. I would show you three examples of these kind of proofs. The first one uh, um, stolen from <laughs> other people, but I think they're good examples of what you can do with these kind of proofs. And the third one is uh, experiment, let's say. So I would like to prove with this kind of proofs um, an underlying idea of two of my projects that I'm working on. So the third example is then related to projects that I'm working on. So let's start with the first one. I want to prove the following theorem, the following relation namely two times the sum from one to a, a natural number n. And this left side should be equal to n squared plus n. So the standard proof is usually by induction. It's a standard technique in mathematics. Usually you give that to first year students. They're quite happy to prove something like that. So that's a very standard proof. But you can also prove that by picture namely about the following. 
So let's start on the left hand side of the equation. Let's start with the blue points here. So what is that? That is the sum in the bracket. That's the sum from one to an integer n. So I start here with the first blue point, that's one plus two plus three plus four and so on. So this picture is obviously for n equals five, but could be generalized to any integer number. So I have to take that twice because it's two times the sum. So I take the blue points plus the orange and yellow points. And now I want to explain the right hand side with my proof. So what is it? I have to combine the two triangles of points. That's this one. But if I combine these two, I see that the diagonal here is uh, doubled. So I have on the diagonal once the blue points, but also the orange points. So if I combine these two triangles, I have to add one more diagonal. I've decided here to add the orange points. But obviously what we then have on the right hand side is we have n times n, so n squared, plus the number of points on one diagonal, so this is n. So obviously what we have proven here, if we take two times the uh, uh, triangles of these points, then I obtain the square n squared plus n points and I obtain inequality. So that was the first proof. And I hope you are now somehow convinced that this equality is true. Also by this, by this second proof. Let's go to the second example. It looks a little bit more complicated. So what I would like to prove is I want to prove the equality pi over four equals the arcus tangent one over three plus the arc tangent one over two. So the original proof was, I guess, given by Euclid a while ago, as you can see. He used power series to prove that. And in principle, he was interested in these kind of identities to approximate the number of pi. So that's the reason why he investigated all these identities. Of course, I don't want to look into the proof of Euclid, but I would like to prove that with the following picture. And to convince you that the identity is true using this picture, maybe I should remember you of some knowledge that you probably or hopefully have from school. So what is the tangent or the arc tangent? So if you start with a triangle that has a right angle, so pi over two or 90 degrees, then you hopefully remember that if you consider the angle alpha here, the orange one, then the tangent of the angle alpha equals the length A over the side B. And what is the arc tangent now? It's just the inverse function of the tangent. So what you have to do is, if you want to compute the angle alpha, you take the arc tangent of A over B. In general, arc tangent is a quite complicated function. Of course, you can compute that by using software, a numerical thing, that's not a problem, but it's not that you can compute that by hand usually. So going back to the picture, we start with a rectangle. We start with a rectangle that is of the size two times three. And we divide that rectangle into four triangles as you can see. And then let's start with the, tri uh, with the triangle on the right bottom here. So obviously we have a triangle that has two sides that are equal, namely the length of these two sides is equals one. Telling you that the green angle here is pi over four. So half of 90 degrees or so 45 degrees. Um, of course, you get the same angle on the other side by the same argument because the triangle on the left bottom side is also has also two equal lengths, namely two and two. So also here you get the two green angles that are pi over four. 
And if you look at this blue angle here, then you obtain that the blue one is again a right angle, is a 90 degree angle, because you have pi plus uh, two times pi over four, which is pi over two, plus pi over two, and this gives you pi, just as the construction um, is. And by this special configuration, you can also compute the length of the other sides of the triangles. So for the right bottom triangle, you get one plus one equals the square root of two. And same story on the other side for the other triangle. So the length of the left triangle on the, at the bottom is two times the square root of two. So first thing, let's focus on the angle on the left corner. So the purple angle alpha here. Obviously, that's the angle that belongs to a triangle that has a right angle because it's one angle of the rectangle that we started with. So what we can do is for this angle alpha here, we can compute the arc tangent. And we know how to do that because it's this side here. This is one over three by construction. So the angle alpha is arc tangent of one over three. A similar thing you can do for the triangle in the middle. It's again a right angle triangle. And you compute the uh, angle beta by taking the arc tangent of, of um, square root of two over two times square root of two. So the square root of two cancels and you end up with one over two. But now you're almost done because if you look at the entire angle on the left corner of our rectangle, then the whole the sum of these four angles here, the green one, the orange one, and the purple one was pi over two, so it was a right angle. But the green one is pi over four, so that one is gone. And we are left with the other two angles, so pi over four equals alpha plus beta, which is nothing else than arc tangent of one over three plus arc tangent of one over two, which was the statement that we wanted to prove. So just by this picture, we see hopefully that the relation is right. You can do the whole thing a little bit more complicated. If you start with a more complicated configuration, you are e even able to prove this more complicated relation between arc tensions. So yeah, if you have some time, you can entertain yourself with that. I think sometimes it's fun to see these kind of proofs. But I won't go into details now. But what I want to do is I want to change to the third example that I want to present. So at the end, I want to create surfaces. And I would like to create surfaces by transporting or by reflecting a certain curve. In this case, a circle, maybe. So what is a reflection? Um, the easy reflection that you all know is we're just reflecting a line. So we have the red line here. And obviously we can reflect, we can reflect the point, this blue one here, or we can also intersect whole circles. So for example, the green, the gray ones or the green ones. But you see that's nice, but a little bit boring because you can't change the radius of the circle. So the radius of the circle always keeps the same. So that's not too exciting to create surfaces with that. So mathematicians come up with a more complicated idea. So we want to reflect in circles instead of lines. And here something more exciting happens. So we want to reflect in this red circle here. And you can see we can obtain different configurations here. If we reflect the gray circle, we end up with a smaller gray circle inside the reflection circle you can reflect a circle that intersects your reflection circle, namely the green one here. Then you end up with a circle that is also half inside your reflection circle. But the two circles that you obtain, they intersect. Because if a point of the circle lies on the red circle, then that one is preserved. So you obtain two circles that are reflected into each other and they intersect in two points. 
And on the red uh, and the right bottom corner, you can see some magic going on. Namely, if you start with a circle that goes through the center of the circle that you are reflecting in, so this black point here, if you reflect this blue circle in the red circle, then you end up with a line. So if and only if your circle that you are reflecting is going through the center of the circle that we that you are reflecting in, you end up with a line. So what can happen here, circles can be mapped either to circles or to lines, depending on your configuration. So what we do is we, in the following, we won't distinguish between circles and lines, and you should not be too, um, too surprised about that, because already Joseph mentioned that you can understand a plane as a sphere with um, infinity radius, so that's more or less the same. You say that a line is a circle and has its radius infinity. So in the following, if I say circle, the circle could be an actual circle or could be a line. Uh, what we do is we consider now three types of circle pencils, so a collection of different circles, and we distinguish between three types. Either the circles intersect all in two points, these two green points, or we have a pencil where all the circles are tangent at one point. So they all have this one point in common and are tangent at that point. Or we consider circles that do not touch or don't intersect. So they don't have points in common. And the underlying property that I want to prove now is if a point P is reflected in circles belonging to a circle pencil, then this point P and the reflected points that we obtain, they all lie on a circle. So what do I mean by that? I start with a circle pencil and with this orange point P and I start reflecting. So I take the orange point and reflect in the first gray circle and I continue and I obtain many reflected circles. And already from this drawing here, you can guess that maybe all these reflected points lie on a circle. But of course, this is no proof. But I would like to convince you that this is true by the following proof. So I have pictures that distinguish the three types of pencils. And we will just focus on one. We will focus on the first pencil, namely on the pencil where all the circles are touched at one point. And by this red circle here, I decided to take a circle that has a center, the touching point, so the green one, the radius doesn't matter too much. So I take this red circle and reflect the whole configuration, the whole sphere pencil in that red circle. So what happens is all the gray circles, they go through the center of the circle of the red one. So they become lines, as I told you before. So we end up with these lines instead of the gray circles. So we end up with parallel lines here. And then obviously, if I start now with point P and start reflecting in all my, all my circles of the pencil, then I obviously obtain points that lie on a, on a line. I mean, that's just by looking at it, you see that the points lie on a line. So this is somehow a proof for the thing that I have shown you before, that if I start with a point and reflect in circles that belong to a circle pencil, I end up with points lying on a circle. And to obtain surfaces, I want to do the same idea, but I want to generalize that a little bit to three-dimensional space. So what I do is instead of reflecting in a line or a circle, I want to reflect in a plane or a sphere. So you see here, you can reflect a circle in space just in a plane and you end up again with a circle. And our three types of sphere pencils are now also in three space. So I have either spheres that have a circle in common, I have spheres that touch at one point, or I have spheres that don't intersect at all. And what I do is instead of starting now with just a point and I reflect this point in my circle pencil, I start with a circle and reflect that circle in my sphere pencil. And I end up with a family of circles, as you can see here. So the grayish spheres is a sphere pencil, 
And I start with one black circle here and transport by reflecting in all the spheres, the circle through the sphere pencil. And if I do that with all the spheres in the pencil, then I end up with this kind of surface here. You see, we have one family of black circles lying on that surface, but due to our construction, we also obtain a second family of circles, namely the horizontal ones here that you can see. So what we did is we created special surfaces, namely surfaces that are foliated by two families of circles. And if you know a little bit more about mathematics, you can also prove that these circles that you constructed are curvature lines. So what we obtained is we obtained special surfaces called also Dupin cycles. It's a very classical surfaces um, investigated by Dupin. And needless to say is that this construction also provides you with an integral discretization of Dupin cycles. So that's a very stable construction that we have here. You can construct also more complicated surfaces with that. You can construct more complicated Dupin cycles here having two singularities or one singularity depending on the configuration of your initial circle and the sphere pencil. So the short briefly, um, connection to my two of my projects. First is uh, you can design with this Dupin cycles. It's a PhD project of one of our PhD students, so Maria Lara Miro. And the idea is that the principles are quite nice for modeling either um, buildings or also to blend between two circles. And the goal here in this project is that we develop tools for designers or architects that they can work with the principles. Even if they don't know about all the mathematics behind, they should be able to um, design with these two principles. And to produce a stable software, we're using exactly this kind of idea that we start with a circle and reflect that in sphere pencils. So Maria already created some buildings that really looks nice. So I'm looking forward to getting a nice software for architects and designers. And the second project is more abstract. So here I think it won't work anymore to prove things by pictures, namely, uh, together with Joseph Cho that you already heard 20 minutes ago and Mason Pamper, another postdoc, uh, we are investigating surfaces with spherical and planar curvature lines. So the idea is how can we understand the geometry of these surfaces? And the idea is exactly the same. The idea is we start with one initial curve. In this case, it's a spherical curve. It's a spherical curvature line. And then we transport this spherical curve uh, by a certain parallel transport in least field geometry. This is a quite abstract thing We're working in R42 space. And if you do that in the correct way, we can construct any of these surfaces with planar or spherical curvature lines. And to mention once at least minimal surfaces, there are also minimal surfaces that can be constructed by the, this method. Maybe you have seen that before, that's an Enable surface. So there are also minimal surfaces with planar or spherical curvature lines. Thank you for your attention. Okay, Gudrun, thank you very much. That was a great talk. You seamlessly flowed from comments about the Pythagorean theorem all the way to Japoncyclides and leaf here geometry. Very nice. Um, we have a number of questions, yeah, and I quite a few, in fact, and I think I'll turn it over to Alberto to pick out the ones that we can cover in a few minutes. Yeah, Alberto. Uh, yeah. Here I am. Hi, Gudrun. Fantastic Hi. talk. Uh, there, there are yeah. quite a number of questions. Uh, I'll try to, to work through them. So the first one, you, I think you have partly answered that, but maybe to, um, to revive it again. So the question was whether your interest in these graphical proofs, does it stem from your own experience, like starting experience, or is this, is this like your own preference uh, for a more visual approach? Uh, how, how did you come to this idea of, of insisting on uh, graphical proofs? Yeah, I think sometimes it's really helpful to just draw a picture and see if, for a simple example, something could be true or not. So usually I really like that, to just make small proofs just by pictures. Of course, as I said before, that's not enough usually to make a rigorous proof, but just to getting ideas, I really like to draw these geometric configurations and to see what's going on, to actually see what's going on. So not to write down what's going on with equations or statements, but to see or to draw what's going on. So I really like that. 
there was a there was indeed a question then on, on this specific point which is how do you distinguish between a proof and an example when you're doing things visually <laughs> it's a very um, difficult question <laughs> Right. So I think one of the main criteria is if you can generalize the picture. So, for example, the first one that I've shown you with the points, with the sums. I mean, uh, can I go back? Yeah. Oop. Many, many slides. Ah, here it was. Yes. So, I mean, this kind of picture here. So this is, you can obviously generalize that to any dimension. I mean, to any, for any n. So this is a proof for n equals five, but mm -hmm. obviously everybody knows how to draw the picture for n equals a hundred because it's just yeah. a system. So I think this is more a proof than just an example for n equals five. But if you draw a special example, usually it's not so clear how to generalize that to all examples. So maybe that's a kind of distinguish or one um, thing that distinguishes an example and a proof. Yeah, this is, but this is, so I will add something uh, from personal experience, when, when I think of when I was in primary school, uh, something that I, I always found a bit confusing was uh, was geometry. And in it's, it's uh, also here, uh, the same idea. Uh, so you said, everyone knows how to do it. So my impression is that in these kind of proofs, there is uh, some in intuition that is taken for granted. So this is like the big difference between with uh, with a formula, more formula based proofs where where um, the level of assumptions that you that you make are, or the level of assumptions and understanding are 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 much smaller. Here in this geometric approach, often you need to see why it's true. Maybe someone proves it, but if you don't see it, then right. you're not convinced. So what, what what do you think about this? Um, I think it's a kind of um, training yeah, that you get in these kind of things. So if you work in geometry for a while, then you get trained. And of course, you see quicker what's going on. But for example, if I don't know, if mathematicians from a completely different field with, I don't know, number theory or whatever, or if somebody is dealing with complicated differential equations, phew, also calculations could be really hard to follow. So for me, maybe that's harder to follow than just a picture. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's more, I mean, you get used to some techniques or some fields and then mm -hmm. you're quicker to see something. Good, thank you. And there's uh, another two questions. So one is if you could explain, what does it mean? So you mentioned, uh, especially towards slide 20, was, it was uh, that you can reflect in a circle. So can you explain what, what, what you mean by that? for a non-mathematician. We have non-mathematicians who are eager to understand more and more and more uh, in Twitch and they, they would like to know better. This was a slide 20. I think it, uh, it was a way to, to construct uh, things. 20, not 12. 20. Um, you were mentioning you are reflecting, I think it was this black, uh, this black, uh, um, right, this is right. conferences, so, and then you, you you said so the words you used are like you're reflecting in a circle, and and not everyone understood what you mean what you mean by that. So if you could explain, right? I mean, I think phew, that's a little bit hard to explain what you do here. So I think it's I mean you can write it down by a formula, but more or less it's just a generalization of what you do if you reflect in a plane. So. Yes, I think a uh, hard answer, uh, yeah, hard question to answer here. Okay, um, it's, it's a difficult question. Someone suggested maybe this was indeed on page, based on page 12, but uh, I, cannot, I cannot really uh, com combine the two, but it's a difficult concept uh, uh, somehow. So, and then the final question, and this is, um, this is also, again, for me, I have, uh, I'm a bit curious about this. It's um, these, proofs or these reasonings relies on perfect drawing. Because, so often like for instance, we use curves, no? Here we have curves and spheres and stuff like this. And um, perfect drawing is impossible. So I'm a numerical analyst. So I would say it's impossible to draw 
to represent graphically with a computer a, a disk. So you have to approximate somehow with pixels and something like this. So at what level do we accept the approximation in the proof? What do you think? Or is this something relevant, do you think? Or, or, or is something that, oh, if you approximate well enough, then you see it and then it's fine. Actually, I'm drawing more concepts than actually the geometry. So I think, for example, if you want to intersect two lines, you have two lines in the plane and you want to, let's say, draw the point of intersection. Then if you draw two lines, yeah. maybe you use a ruler, but then it's impossible to get the exact point, the coordinates of your point of intersection. Yes. I mean, yes, because that's not precise, as you said before. So no, that's not possible. But I mean, you can draw the concept of two lines that intersect. <laughs> so you can visualize that you have two lines that intersect. Of course, you don't get the precise point of intersection, not the coordinates, but you can visualize that. Or you can visualize mm -hmm. two parallel lines just on paper, just without any ruler. I can, let's say, draw two parallel lines because I only want to visualize the concept that I have, yeah. for example, two parallel lines and then I reflect in parallel lines. So I think it's more drawing concepts than drawing precise the geometry behind it. I see. Fantastic. Thank you. So these were these were all the questions that we had so far. Very good. Thank and you. I would like to thank you for, for all your fantastic answers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And next we will have the final um, in infinite elements video and it's on the finite topology conjecture. And I won't say what that is. I'll let the video tell you the story. It's uh, six minutes long. And after that, we'll have a final speaker, Tim Hoffman.
Okay, uh, we will now go on to our next talk. But before we start that, I would like to let everybody know that after this last talk, we're going to have a question and answer session, a discussion session. And people in the audience on Twitch are most welcome to um, include their comments and questions. So please stick around if you would like to. And our next talk is by Tim Hoffman, and uh, I'll let him introduce the title. Tim, go, please. Okay. Um, thank you. So I hope you all can actually see and hear me. Um, so I probably will not share a slide. So I hope then my video feed is, is visible for all of you. Um, my title, well, um, okay, so it was to be announced and um, I could replace that by, by um, I'm not creative enough to come up with an interesting title, which of course should, should make a point. Um, so when Catherine asked me to, to give a talk here and to talk about um, math and creativity or something about math and creativity and um, I could do basically whatever I want, it should tell, well, something about math and creativity. Um, I thought, well, am I actually even qualified for that? I mean, I can't even come up with a good title for that. And um, this, of course, means the following for me. Um, creativity is a, not overused, but a very much used term. And I'm, as a scientist, would probably talk a little bit about what I, what I understand uh, creativity and with creativity. So what, what is creativity for me? Or what do I think is creativity in, in mathematics? Yeah. So, I mean, we make beautiful renderings of surfaces maybe, but that's kind of more craftsmanship for me and not really part of the creative process. After all, I mean, when I show you a surface, um, that surface is nothing I created in a kind of inventive way, I more think about it as I maybe discovered it. So it was there, math told me how it should look like. And um, so my talk will be kind of a little bit anecdotal in, in several senses because um, I once worked with, with architects and um, we had a project together and they figured out that they wanted to basically flip around some polygons in space. And I looked at what they did and said, okay, actually there's mathematical formula behind that. And that mathematical formula basically tells you how the polygons should be placed in space under that evolution. And in the end, they were not very happy with that because they thought, well, what's left to do for us then if math tells you basically where things should go. So for mathematicians, the creativity in many cases does not lie in the, in the image or in the final result. It, and that's basically what Gudrun talked about really. It, it lies in the process, in the, in the methods of finding things. And um, I recently came across uh, some post, some, some tweet on Twitter and actually here it is. So this guy, Robin Houston actually said, well, I found an interesting puzzle in one of Peter Winkler's books and I found it infuriating because first of all, the solution is incredibly simple. And secondly, I didn't think of it. And um, I found this interesting on several Status. I mean, first of all, I found the problem interesting. And the problem is as follows. Given two potatoes, uh, prove that you can draw a closed loop, so a closed curve really, on each, so that the loops are the same shape in 3D space, or if you like, they're congruent. So you can actually place the loops on top of one each other, right? So you have two shapes, and you could Think of them as kind of, I don't know, deformed spheres if you like, but well, the phrasing is two potatoes and um, you should find a closed loop on both of them so that these loops, well, fit. 
each other. And um, when you look at the at the answers or the, the, the comments on, on that tweet, people said, well, I, some people said, well, yeah, I remember that one and I found it hard as well. Others said, well, actually I solved it almost immediately, but probably because I knew it had a simple solution. And this means that you kind of start thinking outside of your kind of default ways you think about things. So you can start and think about this, uh, if you like, in a, in a, I don't know, let's, let's show two potatoes here. So here are two potatoes and you can think about it in a analytical way. You can start thinking, okay, I have to trace a curve on one of these that satisfies extra conditions such that the same curve can exist on the other surface. And I invite you all, if I'm boring you at the moment, to really think about how would you solve that. And it might be that you find it easy and it might be that you find it hard. And this really tells about how you think about that problem. So if you think about it in an analytic way, you might try to pose a differential equation that kind of can be solved simultaneously on two closed shapes. Well, let's at least assume that the potatoes are, I don't know, a smooth objects in a way. So have a smooth surface. And we are not talking about curves in the inside of the potato. So we want the curves on the surface of these two shapes. And um, the other ways to think about it, you could start thinking about it kind of infinitesimally. So let's, Maybe if I make the loop small enough, I can actually find conditions such that things fit in a way together. And um, if you still want to think about this a little longer, um, this is a spoiler alert, so you should probably mute me for a couple of minutes or something and um, maybe switch off video or something because I'm gonna show you what kind of the easy solution is that he didn't think of. And it's a rather visual one. It goes basically like this. You can just shove these two shapes into each other and they will intersect. And they will intersect in a closed curve that lives on both surfaces simultaneously. So if you frame your mind in that sense that you say, okay, I just look how do they actually fit together once a curves actually fit together, then the surfaces need to lie on top of each other in a way, then you immediately see that with any two reasonably smooth shapes, you can actually perform this operation. You just shove them into each other, they have an intersection, and that intersection gives you the result. You still might have to work a little bit if you really want to prove it in a rigorous mathematical sense, you have to kind of figure out that you can find a position such that these surfaces are actually really intersecting transversely and, and, and things like that. But, but that's besides the point, at least a little bit. I mean, it's similar to the discussions after Gudrun's talk, whether um, actually if you draw things, you have to draw it perfectly in order to get a perfect solution. This visual cue is basically telling you what should happen in your mindset in order to understand how the solution actually works. And once you have this understanding, you might find a way to rigorously write it down if you want to have it in a written and not in a visual way like, like this. So why do I think that this has something to do with creativity and mathematics? To some extent, I think this um, idea of being able to think out of the box, to think in a, in a way that is not the usual way you would approach a given problem is what helps you find surprising and in some cases maybe easy solutions to problems that you consider hard when you first think about them. And this is kind of something you, you have to learn to some extent. So in this sense, I think creativity, at least in the way I understand it in mathematics, is something 
that you can learn. You can learn it because um, you can learn to not follow usual habits all the way, to kind of try to shift your perspective, to look at the same things from different angles. At least if one of your default ways to work on things seem to not work. So if you're stuck, you have to be able to sit back and look at it in a different way. The story I like to tell is um, when my daughter was in elementary school, we at some point had a role with her math teacher because um, she complained that our daughter basically didn't solve a type of math problems the way it was taught. And we kind of got furious with her because we thought that if our daughter actually, every time she looks at this type of problem comes up with a different solution, that's actually something very mathematical and very useful. It's a skill set that you can, happy, can be happy to have compared to, well, um, this is a way how we teach you to do it. So go ahead and solve all these problems this way. It might be, in that case, the easiest way. But the ability to actually figure out new and new and new and different and different and different solutions is something that in my mind is very much connected to, to creativity. Also, I found it interesting that in that, in that discussion after uh, below that tweet, actually after the mathematicians agreed that the solution actually once you know how to do it is rather thin, simple, they immediately uh, continue to think about how to make it harder, how to make the problem harder. So they started to think whether one can actually have a similar result in the topological category. So not assuming that the surface of your shapes are reasonably smooth, but just continuous. So that again is something which is very much in, in the creativity mindset. Yeah? You, you look at things, you figure something out, and then you look at things, how can this approach that I just learned, which is for me a new approach maybe, or maybe a useful approach that I learned somewhere else and now figure out I can use here, can I actually use that approach to different problems? So one thing is um, learning something and then applying it to new problems. And the other thing is um, actually trying to figure out something new once you're stuck. So, I might talk a little bit about, um, about uh, some cases where kind of approaching things from a different perspective happened a while back ago for me in, in doing math really. And this ties back to what Joseph talked about and a little bit to what Gudun talked about. And um, the thing I, want to talk about is really, um, well, discrete um, holomorphic maps in a way. So what is that about? Let me kind of, oops, um, let me draw something maybe. I just have to. Um, so, so I've talked about p-holomorphic maps, discrete p-holomorphic maps. And the discrete holomorphic maps I want to talk about are basically made from um, planar quadrilaterals, really, with some conditions. And the conditions is, are that they should lie on circles. And also, um, if you take the product of these edge lengths and divide it by the product of these edge lengths, it should be one. Another way to actually formulate this for the mathematicians amongst you is really to say, if I, if I have my quadrilateral and um, 
you just write these vectors in the complex plane as A, B, C, and D, then you want something like A times C over B times D should be minus one. So the minus one is basically telling you, well, that, that it is of magnitude one basically tells you that the product of these two lengths on top here is the same as the product of the lengths down here. And the minus basically tells you that you're on a circle and the quadrilateral is embedded in the sense that the edges do not cross. Anyway, so this is in a way, if you ask this condition for all the quadrilaterals um, on your grid, then this is a discrete version of a holomorphic map, whatever that means. So the story I want to tell is about really um, a surface that we wanted to build. And I will show you that surface. Um, that surface actually is a surface we wanted to fabricate. And in order to build that surface that is similar to what we've thought about this Weierstrass representation that you take a p-holomorphic function and you shove it into a machinery and out comes a nice surface. This is something very similar. So there is a machinery that actually takes a discrete holomorphic function and it outputs a surface. Now we wanted a particular surface, a surface that had particular symmetries. Yeah, at, at the top there, um, there's a point where you have a rotational symmetry for your surface. And um, this meant that the holomorphic map that we needed to put in should look something like this. this so you see, actually, I'm only drawing kind of a quadrant of, of that map. So you can play several copies around and you give a net of planar quadrilaterals. Now, the problem is what you see here is really a smooth map or sampling of the smooth map. And we, if you remember, wanted to have those with all the quadrilaterals being circular. And if I try to draw the circles here, I mean, out there, because it's almost rectangular, it looks very good. But if you look at the beginning on the um, right side there, you see that it is not really a circular quadrilateral. So we cannot just sample the smooth function and hope to get what we need. So we were kind of stuck. And um, we thought a lot about it and we tried to actually approximate that numerically and it's very unstable and you really do not know how to impose reasonable boundary data for that in order to get just numeric approximations of, of the map we needed. We weren't actually even sure that that map exists. I mean, we hoped for it. We basically had reasons that we, that made us believe that it should be doable, but we had really no handle, no idea on how to get there. So I went over to a colleague in complex analysis and I told him about the problem and said, well, actually we are trying to find this kind of discrete version of that particular holomorphic map. If he had any idea, heard something, knows something. And well, I was very vague because I didn't really know what I needed to ask for. So the answers I got were very vague. And he basically said, no, nah, no idea. I don't really do these discrete things, but um, there's a complex analysis guy in, in Israel, Oded Schramm, and he has kind of a weird circle pattern thing to approximate or to, to model discrete versions of holomorphic maps. And these are actually Quite nice, they look like this. They're not the circular maps we actually wanted because um, we wanted these cross ratio minus one conditions and he had a very different way of doing things. For him, um, the maps were, well, I have these circles and for a quadrilateral four circles touch actually. So I basically draw a circle around each 
vertex of my quadrilateral with the extra condition that through these touching points, there goes an orthogonal circle. And I can build a mesh from that. Now, the points on my, on my lattice actually, they have now inscribed circles and no longer, are no longer inscribed in circles. On the other, it's just the other way around. The circles are inscribed in the quadrilaterals. But he could show things about these. Now, unfortunately, these were not the maps we were interested in. And there was no way to actually get our particular map, this Z to the alpha map that I um, showed you here from his description either. So we learned a little bit about a different guy from a different field that did well, kind of similar things to what we did, but it didn't, didn't fit. And then uh, Sacha Bobengel and I went to a conference uh, in Vienna at the Erwin Schrödinger Institute. And again, a lucky accident really, a guy, Frank Nyhoff, gave a talk about some very algebraic thing that actually they had for a particular system of difference equations, some extra condition that he kind of could impose on those. And we looked at these equations and we thought, well, actually, at least along the axis um, here, along the axis where we actually didn't know how to sample our function, this looked kind of, at least asymptotically, if I go far out, like what we would like to see. And it turned out that actually one could use his extra conditions to find a lattice that looks like this. And um, you probably don't even notice a difference between this one and that one, except that I didn't place them perfectly. Um, but this one here actually um, is circular. So going to somewhere, to a place and learning about something completely independent, well, not 100% independent, but by no means geometric in the way we wanted to do geometry, um, we learned about tools that helped us solve our problem. So it's kind of the other way around in this case. In the first example, I showed you something where the analytic methods were kind of hard. And if you just look at it visually, you understood it geometrically immediately maybe. Now it was the other way around. We had a hard geometric problem and there was a kind of straightforward, well, not completely straightforward, but an interesting, nice algebraic way to get the conditions satisfied that we wanted. Now, where I did I tell you about these intermediate things, um, actually, turns out that this pattern that we find this way also um, has the property that would that Schramm described. So we actually found in the end a solution to our problem in the set of circle patterns that um, I learned about from the, the guy in complex analysis um, by means of a guy who does algebraic discrete integral systems um, that solved our problem and helped us in the end build this surface. So the upshot here for me is maybe um, creativity is not in mathematics, it's not something where you sit back and then the muse comes and kisses you and you have an upside. I mean, it might happen, but that's not what you should kind of work for. You should work for being open-minded and learn to look for solutions to your problems outside of your usual tool set and being able to adapt to new tool sets and actually see that these tool sets might have something to do with your problem. That is something that I think is actually at the core of the creative process in mathematics. And I think I'm kind of already over time. So let me finish with this. And um, I hope you had at least a little bit fun with the potatoes in the beginning. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim.
that was that was excellent and that was you got right to the core of the question about what creativity is in mathematics and that's a perfect segue into the discussion session that we're hoping to have right now so we have a few minutes for questions for you but i thought we'd go directly into the question and the general Please. question of course and because your talk it just starts it off perfectly and there, but we'll start it with a few questions that you got from the audience. And I'd like Alberto to, uh, and by the way, I would like the full panel on Zoom and um, the audience on Twitch to feel free to participate at this point. Okay, Alberto, please. Thank you, Wayne. It's a fantastic talk, very, very interesting. So we have two questions. And we'll start uh, with, with this one. So do you think mathematics is more, uh, uh, product focus or is the process uh, that uh, that counts? So is a destination versus journey kind of? Um, that is an interesting, an interesting question. I kind of struggle with a with the product part of it just because, um, as I briefly mentioned before, it um, I don't feel like I or we are producing something. It's more like um, exploring or discovering things. And um, so of course it is about the discoveries you make, but um, to be able to continuously discover things and to enjoy discover things, for me, it, I think the focus really has to lie with the process in the end. I mean, if you don't enjoy the process, the process in many cases in mathematics is kind of painful. So you have to be very frustration resistant because for most of the part, your methods won't work. You're struggling with things. You do not, you feel you don't make progress for months and months until you might actually abandon your approach, find something new. And then for a brief moment, you have an upside and you have a, a new result and you enjoy that one and you cherish it. But after that, you again have months and months ahead of you where you struggle. So if you're not able to find comfort in the process, it will be very hard in the long term. Absolutely, fantastic answer, thank you. And the second question was, um, it's kind of more philosophical or so, when you decide which tools to employ to solve something, so like if we uh, like if we think of the two potatoes, now the idea of let's try to uh, let's try to intersect them. You know, shift one and, and look at the intersection. Yeah. So trying to now then you learn, learn this technique that you can you can do this, but you could do different things. Someone uh, with more background in analysis may start like with parameterization of the surface or whatever, Dif different approaches, different techniques. Now you as a mathematician, when you decide you have a problem you want to solve, you have a different uh, possible techniques you could apply because you, you, you have an education and you have an experience, but when you, when yeah. you try to solve it, you pick one. So yeah, how do you pick uh, the one that you, so how, how did you pick the one that you pick? Well, uh, unfortunately, often you pick the wrong one first <laughs> in the end. I mean, <laughs> but um, so this is, to, to, well, to some extent, this is experience, of course. I mean, you hopefully learn over time that particular methods are well suited for particular types of problems, which does not prevent um, obstacles, but it helps you steer in a way. And then, um, how do I phrase it? To some extent, when you do mathematics, your, your feel for aesthetics is kind of trained towards truth. Or I, could, I should phrase it differently. I should say something like um, wishful thinking tends to work better in mathematics than in the real world. Meaning that once you're trained a little bit, um, 
you get a, you get drawn towards the more likely uh, paths in a way because you think, well, wouldn't it be beautiful if this would work out that way? And more often than not, it will turn out true. And this is not because things are easy or things are, or you always kind of blindly navigating in the right direction. It is because your kind of sense of structure and sense of beauty is trained in a particular way, which helps you figure out the more probable paths, I guess. And I, I like to call it wishful thinking. I mean, if I think, okay, that would be nice if it was true, um, that helps a lot. If, if kind of your, your notion of niceness is, is the right one, then this will help you get into the right, in, into the right direction. I don't know whether this, this makes sense to you, but... It's fascinating, it's fascinating, thank you. And these were the questions we had from Twitch at this moment. Some, some, we have some comments on the, the, the uh, reiterate that the, how important the process is. Uh, the process, uh, uh, the journey uh, guides the destination or de decides the destination, essentially. This was like uh, sometimes uh, leads to a different destination depending on the journey. There was a comment in this direction, which uh, uh, of course here yeah, we are talking in very general, uh, uh, in a very general setting. So yes, not always true, um, but sometimes it could be true, no? Yes, I mean this this has has different aspects. I mean there are sometimes you have a very clear thing that you want to show or have to show. And you cannot deviate. You cannot say, okay, the past takes me somewhere else and now I show something completely different because, well, it might be that you show something completely different, but your original problem will still stay open and nag you and you still will have to solve it at some point. Um, sometimes if your research is, is more uh, broadly laid out, if you kind of scouting the terrain in a way, then yes, the paths might tell you what to look for really. Sometimes you, you have not yet found the correct formulation of your problem even. So you're looking for something, you figure out, okay, there is something in that direction. Um, there are interesting facts, but I do not have yet a clear grasp on what I actually want to work on or want to show. And then sometimes the path really guides you towards, well, in the end towards better understanding and better understanding of of your problem helps you pinpoint the problem itself, helps you really formulate the problem. So that, in that sense, yes, sometimes the paths can, can help you find, really formulate your problem really. And sometimes of course, happy accidents happen as well. I mean, you think about something and something completely different pops out of it and you just, showed something that you weren't even expecting, weren't even thinking about in the first place. Even that happens sometimes. So, uh, can I but I mean, I think this should be a question for all of you and not just me, I guess. Yeah, I'm hoping um, uh, maybe the artists in the panel would have something to say because we've heard mathematicians talking through the entire event. And maybe you have something to say about uh, what you've heard that is similar to your own experience doing artistic activities. Um, does anybody have? I can um, take the lead. Um, I was wondering, we, we use the phrase thinking outside the box quite easily. Um, and at least I struggle quite a bit with the box basically because the box is, has been given to us so there's always a reference to something, um, whether that's, I, I guess in math, the same prior knowledge in arts is other references. Uh, so I wonder how much, how much we can deviate and how much freedom there is in creativity at the end of the day. Uh, I, I'm, I struggle with that in general, uh, because it, especially in arts, we, uh, we tend to strive for originality and um, but that does not really exist. Um, yeah, I was wondering what mathematicians have to say about the box 
maybe anywhere else. So for me, um, I mean, the way I used it um, today was basically the box was a stand-in for um, my usual approach to problems or my usual approach to a given type of problem. So if I'm facing a problem, I look at it and that kind of helps me decide how to think about it. I look at it and I think, okay, I have to solve this analytically. It's a smooth surface. I have to find a curve on that surface. I have tools for dealing with curves and surfaces. So I run that way without further thinking about whether this is actually a good way to go about it. So in that sense, I use the box really as a, as a um, metaphor for kind of, um, default ways of thinking or defaults, default ways of proceeding. Um, there's of course the other box, which is kind of the, the, the given rules, the rules of the game you play. And um, that might be more the kind of box or not box that, that you were referring to, I, I don't know. I mean, it's like we mathematicians are kind of used to, um, to the setup. Okay, here's this given set of rules play with it. So find something out about it. What can you do with these given rules? I mean, that's a, that's a setup that some artists I think struggle with. Some artists actually actively seek it. I mean, Stockhausen's idea of, of uh, 12 tone music was exactly that. He really defined a very stringent corset for his own creative work in order to unleash it in a way. So he gave him very strict rules to kind of form a very tight box to, to work with really. But this is a box, a self-imposed box. And this is more like the rules we have that we follow in mathematics, our axiomatic systems, the, the kind of setup in which we work, which predefines boundaries in which we have to move and in which we have to find our ways. And finding new ways to look at this in order to find new ways, that's what I refer to as being out of the box, so, but I don't want to break the rules. I cannot break the rules of mathematics to say, okay, for me, this is now something different entirely. Yeah, so there are these two kind of ways to, to well, yeah, what, what to make of this idiom, the box or outside the box. So perhaps there can be certain boxes that are actually more freeing within those limitations. I guess so, I guess so. But I mean, you have, to, you have to get to this playful approach that you do not feel them as restraints, but as challenges in a way. I don't think Obstacle that- Obstacle courses. I don't think the boxes actually exist outside of us. They're inside us, they confine us, and we are making them up. I mean, my experience, it's not the only, experience that's possible. I know colleagues who are very different in this, but in my experience and that of many of my students, we, uh, we try to learn certain skills and become really good at it. And this defines our box in which we think. So it's, uh, and it's similar to, to artists. So some of you might be good at pencil drawings. Some of you might be working with certain fabrics or with clay and specific materials or just specific topics maybe and become really the experts in it and have done everything with it and figured everything out. And this defines your own personal box. But uh, then you start talking to people or maybe experiencing new things and you wonder, oh, this is what this person did. Maybe I can do that with my skills too. And uh, out of the sudden you're out of your box and then you're broadening your horizon. And uh, this is, I think this is, this is one of the fascinating experiences for me as a mathematician that out of the sudden somebody comes with a problem. I've never even thought about it could be a problem. And I'll sit down and say, oh yeah, I know how to do this because I have my skills. So I approach that with my personal skills. Somebody else might be doing this differently. And then I solve somebody else's problem. And uh, that is a good feeling. And I think for artists, it's a similar thing. When you out of the sudden can create something that wasn't in your head before you created it but you use your skills to do it, but it's something something else that wasn't there before. I think that's why it's so important to 
discuss and uh, get inspired by people who are from different fields and realms because there'll be different parameters, different boxes within certain brains and, you know, outputs and such. So I, when I watched um, Lee and Valentino and Chloe's piece last night, which was about dance and triggering sound and lights, it made me think about um, my own practices in other realms like poetry and music, et cetera. Um, of how I can, you know, change the, or, or th use, you know, concepts to implement in my way that where I've reacted to, to, to a way of a way of thinking, you know, that's really inspiring to kind of engage with all kinds of brains. <laughs> what about mathematicians? Do you, you know, do you can communicate with people from other fields and find new paths in your brain to how to solve problems or how to think about mathematical things? Yeah, absolutely. We, we I find that exposing myself to different things um, makes me think better about what I'm trying to do in mathematics. And in fact, I experienced that tonight with the talks I've heard. They've um, reminded me to try to think differently about the problems I'm looking at. I had different collaborations with artists, and uh, the most recent one was with an origami artist from China, Zhang Wei Wu. She is local too. She's here in, in Bloomington, and uh, she came to me with a problem. She wanted to know whether one can fold certain things, and I gave up because I thought, yeah, one can analyze the problem, uh, get a bunch of equations. They're horrible to solve. They're mathematically not interesting. And she was, of course, offended because she thought, well, if she had an answer to this, she could do this. And uh, but then. We started talking about things. I realized this had to do with these polyhedral surfaces that sometimes they are surprisingly deformable. And she found that interesting and she went home. And the next time she came with a completely stunning model that could be folded in a particular way. And I, out of the sun, realized, oh, this is really cool if this is possible. Let's investigate that. And uh, so we started talking about this and slowly a little bit of a theory involved that didn't turn out to be that deep, but it was completely novel. And whenever we had made progress with that theory, she came up with something new that expanded the horizon. So she was kind of the creative driving force. I could have never imagined the shapes she came up with. And I was, this was just absolutely fascinating, this, this intuition about uh, what is possible in, in shapes and motion. I mean, I, I'm in geometry, but still my geometric intuition is poor compared to what she could come up with. And on the other hand, she had no way of describing formally what she actually had done and did, to explore the possibilities. And this turned out to be an, a really nice, balanced collaboration. This is rare. I mean, um, we, have, we had this, so I, I forgot who this was we had, uh, of, of you guys, this, this experience with artists that uh, very often we, as mathematicians, we have all these nice creative shapes and things, but they are given, they're fixed. There's nothing you can do to them anymore as an artist. If you, we, they come to us and say, oh, this is a shape, I want to make this. We give them the shape and the equations say, oh yeah, but I want to have maybe this more curve there or the shape this way instead of that. Can you do this? No, this is the cost of surface. This is it and there's nothing else. And this is frustrating because it takes away the creativity from the artist. And on the other hand, uh, there's already perfection in the mathematical shape and this is frustrating for, for the artist, I think. So uh, therefore, I think if an mathematician wants to collaborate with an artist, they need to be free from their constraints about perfection in mathematics. So they need to be allowed, okay, yeah, let's distort this a little bit. It won't be a minimal service anymore, but it gives more freedom. So this means the artist is allowed to do something to it. So this is a, a give and take. We, we allow the artist to do something like that and we get back creativity from them that allows us to see things that we haven't seen before. So I have to jump in here because we have to finish by the top of the hour. And this has been a wonderful event these last four days. And it's only appropriate that the primary organizer of this event give the closing remarks. So Katrin, I turn it over to you. Okay, so can you see me now? Um, yes. So, um, yes. yeah, so um, I really have to say some thanks now. So um, it has been a wonderful week or four days and um, I should mention um, some of our sponsors. So we have been supported by the University of Leicester and in particular the Leicester Institute for Advanced Studies. And 
I should mention two people in there. Uh, one is Diane Levine and the other one is Charlotte uh, King. Without these two, which were really supportive and helped us um, and lots of um, questions about the whole project, we couldn't have done anything. Um, we have had support from the Welcome Trust, which sort of started out the whole project. So um, before we did start this bigger Tiger Team thingy, we had um, sort of a pilot project. And, um, and for this funding, I should really mention Marine Nugent, I'm, I'm possibly misspelling, um, pronouncing her, and G. Um, Sian, which both sort of let me uh, help me to, to start and get in touch with artists in the third place. So um, the way how to find and interact with artists was very much helped along with the two of them. And then of course I should ask the whole Tiger team. Um, so in the past days you have seen some of the artists and some of the scientists being part of the team. But in the background, there are way more people hanging out and supporting us, cheering us on, supporting us in all kinds of ways. So thanks to all of them. So those who have presented and shown their work, but also to those which helped with their ideas and support in the background. And in particular, I should mention Mateus, who you can see on screen now, because he is sort of the person who made this all possible by helping us with all the technical issues around streaming on Twitch and having Zoom and um, all these kinds of things. So um, thank you very much, Matthias. That was really, really great. And yeah, so and last but not least, I should um, thank the audience. So we had uh, lots of people joining us for our adventures. So um, and engaging with our discussions, having lots of um, good ideas. Um, I think out of some of the comments, we're already starting to think about our next projects um, in, in this adventure. So thank you everyone for joining in and I hope we're gonna see you for our second Math Meets Arts Festival, maybe in person, who goodness, <laughs> whether we are allowed at any time, um, but maybe we're yeah. gonna have sort of a hybrid version as well so that people all over the world can join us as well. Um, next time around. So see you then, I suppose. Thank you very much. Bye.